All right. In this uh, structural geology help video, we're going to be looking at how to use a stereo net to find the principal stresses or the orientations of the principal stresses, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. So this is the format of a question that you might be given. Given slick insides with orientations 15 degrees, 62 degrees southeast, and 20 degrees, 68 degrees northwest, find sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. So before we do that, I want to just draw a picture of what that problem is actually asking you to do. So um, let's say that to the north is some direction out to the side. So maybe you're a geologist and you're doing field work in an area with um, plenty of graben. So I'm just going to draw a 3D view of a graben. There's the graben floor. Maybe there's a river in it. So you're out in the field and you see slick insides. So it's a fault wall where you can see multiple slick in lines. And so that defines a slick inside. So you go, you take the strike and dip on that. And what you get for that strike and dip of that plane is 0, 1, 5, 62 degrees southeast. And now let's say you hike down, you go across the valley floor, and you come over here to this side, and let's say that there are more slick insides on that side of the graben, and you take a measurement there to get the strike and dip on that side, and that's where you get your measurement of 0, 2, 0, 68 degrees northwest. And the reason why I drew a graben instead of a conjugate thrust fault system was I had a feeling seeing these dips in the 60s that we were not dealing with thrust faults, that we might be dealing with um, normal faulting with dips that high. So in this scenario, there's a place underground where those two faults might meet. Okay. And we can draw in our principal stresses. So first off, if we're dealing with a system like this, where um, we've got two faults that are, are intersecting, forming a conjugate system, the principal stress that lies in both planes of those faults is sigma 2. So this is sigma 2. And sigma 2 is going to be horizontal here, because these planes are coming down and intersecting. And so that the, the intersection of those two planes is approximately horizontal, right? Think about two faults coming up, intersecting. This is approximately horizontal. So that's sigma 2. And again, that's because it's lying in the planes of the fault. Um, sigma 2, sigma 1, and sigma 3 are all going to be perpendicular to each other. That's uh, one of the rules in Anderson's theory of faulting. So if I have sigma 2 that's lying in a fault plane, it's actually in both fault planes, but I'm just going to draw it in this one. If I have sigma 2 there, and sigma 1 and sigma 3 are perpendicular to sigma 2, then sigma 1 is going to be something like that. Sigma 3 is going to be something like that. And if this is in the fault plane, they're going to be lifted up just a bit off that fault plane. And sigma 1 and sigma 3 are going to be in their own plane. Like that. Okay, so sigma 2 is not in that plane. It's actually perpendicular to it. Okay, so now that we've got this broken down a little bit, let's make some predictions. So if this is a normal faulting system and sigma 2 is horizontal, I'm going to expect sigma 2 to have about the same strike as these two measurements. So sigma 2, I'm anticipating to have a northeast strike and a low or shallow dip. For sigma 1, in a, in a normal fault, sigma 1 is vertical. So here, I'm not going to make a prediction about a strike, but I'm going to say a steep dip. 
And sigma three, the smallest principal stress here is horizontal, coming in like this. And so I'm going to say that it's going to have a very low dip and that its strike is going to be perpendicular to sigma 1. Eh, I'm not going to make that prediction right now. So this is my estimation of the scenario that I think is going on. So I think now we're ready to use the stereo net. And just as a rule of thumb, I don't. I always sketch out um, the scenarios that I'm working with because it gives me kind of a visual to check my stereo nets instead of just relying on, um, you know, the answer that I get from the stereo net. I can go back and think about what I actually drew. Okay, so let's get these slick and sides plotted on here. Remember that slick and lines are um, vectors or lines, and so they would plot as points on a stereo net. But a slick and side is a surface defined by slick and lines and surfaces or planes are always going to plot as lines on a stereo net. So let's plot a slick and side with the orientation 1562. So we're going to go over 15 degrees from north and put a tick mark. And I know that I'm going to be counting in from the east because this dip is southeast. So as I rotate this to the north, I'm gonna count in from whatever's closest to the east. I'm gonna count in 62 degrees. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 62. And then I'm gonna draw in the gray circle associated with that point. Now I'm gonna rotate this back to north. So if I wanna imagine this plane in space, I can put my hand vertical over the eraser and I can rotate my hand to my fingertips match this strike point. And then I dip my hand until it represents where my hand would start to slice the stereo net. So that's about what that plane looks like. Let's plot our next plane. It is 20, 68. So I'm gonna go over to 20 Put a tick mark. And this time we're dealing with a dip to the northwest or a dip going like this. So I'm gonna wanna count in from the left side. I'm gonna rotate over to 20, count in from the left or from the west, 68 degrees. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 68. Draw in that great circle. And rotate it back. So while this plane, we'll call it plane A and plane B, while plane A is dipping this way, plane B is dipping this way, and they're actually pretty steeply dipping together. So that's good. That that goes along with a lot of the picture that we drew. Okay, now in the picture we said that sigma 2 was in the plane of the faults. And there's only one point on the stereo net that's going to describe a line in the plane of those two faults and it's their intersection point. So that intersection point is sigma two. If we wanted to, we could read off the strike and dip of that point right now. And remember, because it's a point on the stereo net, in real life, it's a line. So now, to get sigma one and sigma three, we have to remember that sigma one and sigma three live in a plane perpendicular to sigma two. So we're gonna have to deal with things 90 degrees from sigma two. So what we're gonna do is rotate sigma two down to the horizontal. Good. And we're gonna count 90 degrees over from sigma two. So right now sigma two looks like it's about four, four degrees in from the primitive circle. So let's go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. It's very close over here.
to my eraser. So I'm going to pull my eraser off. Okay. This is a pretty steep plane. If I were going to use my hand to model it, I'd go like this and barely have to tilt my hand out. So that's the plane that is where sigma 1 and sigma 3 are going to lie. Now, sigma 1 is going to bisect the acute angle between the fault planes. So this angle right here is pretty small. And we can actually, we can count through here and measure the degrees. So this fault, or this, uh, this angle, the angle between the two fault planes is about 12, 22, 32, 42, 50, about 50 degrees. And so we're gonna cut that angle in half, which is 25, and we're gonna count over 25 to put our point. So maybe two, 12, 22, 24, 25 is about right there. And that's gonna be sigma one. That's the um, pr principal stress that's bisecting the acute angle here. And we also know that sigma three is perpendicular to sigma one. So it's 90 degrees away. But we also know that it lies on the same plane as sigma one. So what we could do is we could count this angle out here, this obtuse angle, divide it in half, and we could bisect that. Or we could just count 90 degrees over from sigma one. And we already know that this is 25. So now I'm just gonna go over here and I'm gonna count 65 more. So 25 um, plus eight is 33, 43, 53, 63, 73, 83. Uh, 85, 87, 89, 90 is right there, way up on the end, and that's sigma 3. Okay, so what I want to do first, now that we've got these points, before we start reporting what their orientations actually are, is I want to make sure that these um, go with our predictions. So we've got a sigma 2, that has a shallow dip. I know that because it's close to the primitive circle. I've got a sigma one that's a very steep dip because it's close to where my eraser went. I've got a sigma three that's close to the edge. And remember these, just like the planes where we did that with our hand, we could take the pencil and pretend that we're running it along the inside of a bowl. So to have the tip of our pencil land over here, we've got to have a pretty shallow pencil dip pretty shallow pencil dip, but to get sigma one like that, that's pretty steep, pretty vertical. Okay, um, sigma two and sigma three, their strikes are about 90 to each other. So I think that was also one of the predictions that we made. So when we look at the scenario that we drew with the Graben, we've got sigma one vertical, which is what we drew, and sigma three and sigma two, we can talk about their strikes because they're both pretty horizontal and they're about 90 to each other, which is what we predicted before. So now we're ready to actually say what the orientations of sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three are. And all I'm doing is highlighting these in color so that we can look at them a little bit better. So the first thing that we do when we wanna identify where uh, the strike and dip of a of a point or the trend and plunge of a line is we rotate that, and I'm gonna start with sigma two. We rotate the point we're interested in down to the horizontal and we put a tick mark. And I'm gonna remind myself that that corresponds to sigma two. And then we count our way in and we get about five. That means that five is the plunge. Now if I rotate north back to north, I can count over to where I drew sigma two, and that's the strike, or the trend. So I've got 10, 12, 14, 16, about 17. So sigma two is at 
zero one seven five degrees and it's plunging to the if I take my pencil in the middle barely tilt it it's plunging to the north or northeast okay let's do Sigma 3 next I take Sigma 3 rotate it to the horizontal put a tick mark remind myself that that's Sigma 3 Sigma 3 is about 2 in from the edge, so our plunge is 2 degrees. And if I rotate back to north, I can count over. That's 280, 282, 284, 286, and 2 degrees. And if I take my pencil and try to plunge it over there, it's pretty much to the west. A little bit to the northwest. Finally, we'll do sigma one. So I'm gonna take sigma one down here, rotate it to the horizontal. Yep, put a tick mark. Remind myself that that's sigma one. And I can rotate, oh, I forgot to count. Sorry, guys. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 86. So it's plunging 86 degrees. Very, very steep. And if this is 180, this is 178. So 178 and 86 degrees and it's plunging if I take my pencil I can tilt it over just a little bit to the south now a perfectly um, Andersonian system of faulting and we were dealing with normal faults Sigma 1 would be perfectly vertical so we would not be able to talk about a strike for that um, but here and in real life it's not perfect so you're gonna have a little bit of a strike Right. I hope that that helped you guys uh, learn how to find orientations of sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, the principal stresses, when you're given information about the fault planes. Thanks.